Hello and thank you for attending our session. My name is Tom Benkowski. I'm a director of product marketing here with Netscout. And with me today is Roland Dobbins. Roland is a principal engineer for our Atlas Security Engineering Response Team, otherwise known as ACER. Today we're going to talk to you about a ongoing DDoS extortion campaign. Roland, before we get started, let's talk about the difference between a DDoS extortion attack and ransomware. Okay, sure. So a DDoS attack is an attack against availability, where an attacker wants to take down the pu public-facing um, application and services delivery infrastructure of an organization, like their website, for example, or a VPN concentrator, or um, a session border controller, or a VoIP PBX, or something of that nature. And so the attacker sends floods of, uh, of uh, attack traffic to flood those services and uh, take them down. Uh, DDoS attacks are attacks against capacity and or against state. And so with a DDoS extortion campaign, what we see is that we, we see attackers who will uh, often launch a demonstration attack against an organization to attempt to take down uh, some of their public facing uh, infrastructure. And then we'll come to them and say, okay, we've, we launched an attack at this date and this time, uh, this type of attack. And we're going to continue to launch attacks and to keep you offline unless you pay us a certain amount of money. So it's like the, the old protection racket, um, as it were. That's what extortion uh, really is. And um, so that's what we're seeing. And we, this is not a new phenomenon. We've been seeing this on the, on, uh, it actually the, the waning days of ARPANET. And then we started seeing it for money um, probably 22, 23 years ago on the internet as the internet became commercialized. So this isn't um, a new phenomenon uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And with regards to ransomware, which you asked about, ransomware is a different kettle of fish. Uh, ransomware is when an attacker has created some malware that can exploit a vulnerability in an operating system, and the attacker is able to somehow get the malware on the computers and servers of an organization. And um, it compromises them, then it encrypts the hard drive so that the applications and data of the organization are no longer available. And then the attacker demands a ransom for, uh, in, in exchange for providing a decryption key so the organization can uh, gain access to their data and applications again. And so that's the difference. Extortion is when you tell someone, um, you're, I want you to do X, and if you don't do X, um, like give me money, I'm going to do something to you. Ransom is when you take something or someone away and say, I'll give that something or someone back um, if, uh, if uh, you, you uh, pay me. And so that, that's kind of the difference between the two. Okay, great. So now let's talk about the DDoS extortion campaign that ACERT is currently seeing. Sure. So this is a very high profile um, DDoS extortion attack campaign. Um, we've been, like I said, we see these attacks like 24 by 7 by 365. They're not a new phenomenon uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But what we've been seeing um, since mid-August is a very aggressive, high profile uh, extortion attack campaign where the threat actor is um, launching attacks against numerous types of organizations. Many of them are aligned with the financial industry, with the travel industry, as well as some ISPs and telecommunications and, and, and some other verticals as well. But it seems like that financial and financial adjacent stuff like, uh, like the travel industry seem to be the main targets. And so the attacker will do the typical bit of, first of all, launching a demonstration attack, then demanding an extortion payment. And then in a lot of cases, if the target organization does not pay the extortion uh, payment, then this attacker will just move on to another target. But in some cases, the attacker um, actually get, becomes very aggressive and follows up with more and more and more attacks against the organizations who don't pay. And um, we also see that on several occasions, this particular threat actor has actually gone after the ISPs, the upstream transit ISPs, of the organizations uh, that he's targeting, and even uh, MSSPs, managed security security service providers, who provide uh, DDoS mitigation services. The attacker has tried to attack them as well, and the cadence of these attacks is is very high. This attacker is attacking 
many, many, many different organizations um, on, on a, a, a pretty globalized basis. And we've seen attacks ranging from um, something like 50 gigabits per second up to 300 gigabits per second and from 150 uh, kpps up to about 175 million uh, packets per second with multiple vectors being used simultaneously in many cases okay let's go a little bit deeper what attack vectors are they using sure so um, this attacker seems to lean very heavily on various UDP reflection amplification attacks. For example, we see a lot of DNS reflection amplification, CLDAP reflection amplification, NTP reflection amplification, sometimes some SNMP reflection amplification attacks as well. Um, in addition to that, the attacker will sometimes make use of GRE or ESP flooding. GRE is its own protocol. So for example, TCP is protocol six. Uh, ICMP is protocol one. UDP is protocol 17. GRE uh, is protocol um, 47, if I remember correctly. Uh, ESP, which is part of IPsec or IPsec, is protocol 50. And so attackers sometimes will make use of these non-TCP, non-UDP, non-ICMP protocols um, as DDoS uh, attack traffic because in many cases, the targeted organizations don't really think about anything except TCP and UDP and ICMP. And so they don't have access control lists or firewall rules or any kind of protection that would filter out that traffic that is normally out of bailiwick for them. And so the, the main emphasis has been on volumetric attacks. Now, there, the attacker um, may also uh, be using some additional attack methodologies on a case-by-case on a -case basis. And we also know that this attacker uh, works to monitor the efficacy of the attacks. And if the defenders are successfully defending uh, against one vector, then the attacker will move to another vector. And he'll also the attacker will also um, use multiple vectors at once, you know, to launch what we call multiplex DDoS attacks. So um, th these are uh, the tactics uh, that we're seeing and the attack methodologies that we're seeing. What we have not seen in this attack campaign to date is anything that we really haven't seen before. The attacker is certainly skilled. Um, there's evidence that this attacker uh, does, in fact, engage in pre-attack reconnaissance. So the attacker isn't just going after, say, the w web server of an organization or the DNS servers, but oftentimes we'll do some probing and we'll identify some server, service, or application that's actually a key part of the application and services delivery uh, um, infrastructure of the organization that's being attacked, but that that organization themselves, they might not have thought about this when they're looking at DDoS protection. And so the attacker will go after that other ancillary service that still has the effect of, of uh, rendering the organization's online presence non-functional, and then will issue the extortion demand. So a lot of, of, of planning goes into this. Um, the attacker's obviously working you know, from, from some lists of different organizations in different verticals. Uh, another aspect of this campaign is that the attacker has gone to a lot of care to ensure that the DDoS extortion demands are, act are sent to email uh, addresses that are actually being monitored. In a lot of cases with DDoS extortion, the extortionist will just go and look at the website of the target and pick a few email addresses that are listed on that website and send the extortion demand. But in many cases, those email addresses actually don't go to live mailboxes that human beings really look at. And so it seems that this attacker has actually done some due diligence and identified not only role type accounts, but individuals within the targeted organization to send email uh, to with the extortion demand. Okay, let's look at it from a different perspective. We at NetScout uh, have products and services. We have a SOC that is helping customers fight these attacks. You yourself are on the front lines helping our customers fight some of these attacks. What are you seeing from that perspective? Well, it's important to understand, Tom, that um, the reason that most EOS attacks succeed is due to the unpreparedness of the defenders. If the defenders have a DDoS mitigation plan in place, they have uh, contracted with an organization using NetScout Arbor-powered 
uh, DDoS mitigation solutions, and they have an organic on-site DDoS mitigation capability, then, and they, they've made sure that they provisioned it appropriately and have all of their critical functions set up um, within the system, then we see that those attacks are relatively easy to defend against. I mean, they're um, a, a nuisance, obviously, but organizations that are prepared um, can in fact defend against these attacks using our solutions with no difficulty. And we've worked with several of our customers um, to fend off these attacks. And we've also heard from a number of others who were able to use our, uh, NetScout Arbor technology and solutions to defend against the attacks and didn't even have to open a case with us or, or reach out to us because they were pretty routine. Uh, the, the big challenge here is when the targeted organization, however, is not prepared because there can be um, some logistical issues associated with getting um, a, an upstream mitigation service prepared. And in the meantime, it's really important that organizations not only have a cloud-based or upstream transit-based DDoS mitigation service, but that they have their own organic on-site mitigation capability as well, because that can be deployed pretty much instantaneously. And it also allows uh, the targeted organizations to have uh, very fine control over the provisioning of uh, countermeasures and protections for the different types of servers and services uh, that, that they are actually have on the internet. And then that can be coordinated um, with an upstream provider as well. And they can even have their on-site NetScout Arbor-based solution communicate to the upstream-based solution when the bandwidth uh, or the throughput of an attack exceeds certain bits per second or packet per second thresholds to initiate mitigation upstream uh, in the cloud. And so with that model in mind, we've seen organizations who were very well prepared, who were hit by these attacks, and they didn't suffer um, any, any downtime or any uh, loss of availability. We've seen other organizations who were not prepared and did suffer some pretty serious um, uh, loss to availability. And some of those organizations were the ones where the attacker, for whatever reason, chose to persist and launch multiple attacks when that targeted organization didn't pay up. And in fact, went after the upstream ISPs and, and other MSSPs. And that's a very important point uh, that we want to make sure that organizations understand is that no matter what, they must not pay, they must not give in to these extortion demands. Because number one, the extortionist will lie. He'll say that uh, the extortionist will say that, okay, I won't target you anymore if you pay. That's not true. The extortionist will come back again and again and again. And also that these criminals often talk to each other in the underground, you know, digital uh, demi mond. And they'll say, hey, I targeted organization X and they paid me X number of Bitcoins. And so then that'll set off a frenzy of copycat attacks. And so uh, all these different threat actors will say, oh, well, this organization paid, so they'll pay me too. And so we don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. Okay, so you talked a lot about how customers can utilize smart DDoS protection products like from NetScout uh, and or use um, their ISP or a managed uh, DDoS protection provider to protect themselves from DDoS attacks. But what if someone had neither? What if they didn't have any dedicated products and or services? What do you say to those folks? Sure. So one of the things that really sets us apart uh, in the DDoS mitigation space, besides the fact that we're, we are the market leader and we've been in uh, this business continuously for, for two decades now, uh, I think longer than, than just about any other organization in the DDoS space, is that we take a holistic approach where we understand networking, we understand network architecture, we understand DNS and DNS architecture, we understand content delivery and application delivery and that sort of thing. And so we work with our customers and with customers of our customers uh, in some cases to ensure that all the different best current practices or BCPs have been um, implemented to protect the network infrastructure. We work to make sure that the uh, authoritative DNS infrastructure, for example, for of an enterprise is robust and resilient and is logically segmented and can be defended um, with an internet service provider like a broadband ISP, for example, that provides internet access to, to users, an eyeball network, as it were. We work to take a look at the recursive DNS infrastructure to make sure that that um, is, is resilient and um, can be defended. And we can also provide 
pointers on how to make to leverage certain uh, technologies that may be built into the network infrastructure to help with mitigation while we work to get a solution in place. But again, this is where that on-site mitigation capability becomes important because we have basically two categories of solutions uh, for, for DDoS mitigation. We have the um, large high capacity uh, cloud-based or upstream transit-based mitigation solutions. And then we also have the on-premise mitigation solution. And the on-premise solution is very easy to deploy, but we do have to work with organizations to make sure that the network infrastructure has been hardened, the DNS is resilient, because a, a smart attacker will go after the network infrastructure, will go after the DNS. And we've seen that during this attack campaign as well. All right, excellent. So in closing, Roland, do you have any final words of advice for our audience? Well, the main thing that I want to get across is that DDoS attacks are simply a fact of life on the Internet. Um, they've been with us since the beginning, and they're going to be with us uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. And so it's very, very important that if on your online presence is important to your organization, especially in this era of, of massive um, shifts towards remote work and that sort of thing, it's important to have a DDoS response plan in place, to have... Uh, DDoS mitigation and, and protection set up, both in terms of uh, upstream or cloud-based services, as well as an organic on-premise type of capability. It's important to ensure that as new applications and services are deployed, that they are, are brought under that umbrella of DDoS protection. And it's important to, from time to time, rehearse the plan to make sure that traffic diversion works properly, to make sure that all the different applications and services that may have been added or, or changed in the interim since the last time you rehearsed um, have in fact uh, been accounted for under uh, and, and provisioned appropriately uh, for DDoS mitigation. And that all the different uh, individuals who have roles uh, for, uh, for um, a response to DDoS attacks um, can be reached and that the mitigation plan is updated with new personnel or changes in roles and, and uh, you know, phone numbers and instant messaging addresses and things like that as necessary. You have to be prepared. If you're prepared, and uh, in, in most cases, um, it, it, it is, you're, you're going to be uh, in a position to shrug off the vast majority of DDoS attacks. And even when there are the very large, more sophisticated ones, um, again, it's much easier to tune the mitigation and defend the organizations who are already prepared. You don't want to be having to redesign your network, re-engineering your DNS architecture, and trying to provision a DDoS service, um, mitigation service, during the middle of an attack if you can avoid it. Excellent. Okay, that about wraps it up. For more information about this DDoS uh, extortion campaign, you can visit our ACERT blog located at nescout.com slash ACERT. There you will see a blog outlining much of what we talked about today. Uh, in addition, you can visit Cyber Threat Horizon. Cyber Threat Horizon um, is a uh, free portal located at netscout.com slash horizon. And there you'll see a real world depiction of DDoS attacks as seen through the eyes of Arbor products deployed all over the world. You can also reach out to your local uh, NetScout sales team. They'll be glad to talk to you more about some of the products and services that we can offer you. And on behalf of NetScout, we'd like to thank you for your time today. Have a great day. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure as always.